so let's then go further if there aren't any questions about PEFT. Okay, so as I said, now we are going to kind of, we are now shifting bricks. So I know it's in the middle of the lecture. Maybe you don't like that. You can't get over the, that you just learned PEFT and why are we now talking about question answering? So hear me out. We are shifting gears. We are talking about a whole other topic now. And the topic we are talking about is one NLP application, which is question answering. Okay. I don't know why I'm clicking the wrong buttons. Okay. So question answering is, um, I wouldn't even call it a task. It's such a big collection of many different tasks in NLP. So what I want to do first now today uh, is just try to map this massive landscape in such that you can try to envision what are the different directions in question answering in NLP. Okay, question answering, I think as the name say, you are asking some NLP system like ChatGPT questions. And the reason you are asking these questions is because you have some information need, right? You don't know about something and you want to fill in uh, this uh, gap to learn something. So it's not one like a huge uh, surprise that this became one of the major tasks uh, in NLP. However, in NLP, you will see different intents behind questions in our question answering data sets and our question answering applications. And I will divide them into two categories. One intent will be to ask information, to seek information from the uh, system. And you do not have this information. For example, maybe you uh, forgot who the president of France is and you are uh, searching for this information. A whole other intent behind the question in a question answering data set in NLP could be to try to test the knowledge of uh, another person or machine. Um, so let me maybe instead go into examples. So this is an example, natural questions is a data set of information seeking questions. See here, the question is, when are hops added to the brewing process? And the answer could be the boiling process. And another option in this data set is to provide a longer answer, which is basically a paragraph in Wikipedia where the gist of the answer is contained uh, in. So here we assume that someone is really interested to in know this question and we want to provide the answer. Now, that other, um, excuse me, the other uh, type of question answering data set where the intent is to probe the machine's knowledge are usually what we call reading comprehension data sets, where you have a given passage, the model does not need to retrieve it. You, it's given a passage or a longer text, and we ask the question in the context of that passage. So for example, here, drop is to this day still very uh, um, actively examined data set even by OpenAI because it's all about testing the model's ability to answer questions that require discrete reasoning, like reasoning about mathematical, using mathematical operations. So here, the question is how many touchdowns were scored in the second half and the passages to start the season, those Lions travel to South Tampa, Florida, and so on. And um, if you read this whole passage, which I don't want to do now because it's really complicated and I don't know anything about American football, but you would need to do some kind of reasoning about uh, when certain touchdowns have happened in uh, certain parts of uh, this uh, game. And when you collect all these pieces of knowledge, you can reason about them, then you can answer uh, this question, um, which is two. This is from the last year when I had wrong uh, answer, so <laughs> ignore this. So this is how these probing data sets look like, right? Like no, not many people are really interested to know how many touchdowns there were in this, um, you know, uh, 
in the context of this game, uh, but we use these questions to test the model's knowledge about reasoning uh, uh, across uh, symbols. Okay, so question answering, when we use it in NLP, and we use it in many different ways, but the more often it will be associated with information seeking questions. So the questions that are real queries by users of search engines like Google search or Reddit or Stack Overflow and so on. These questions are often gonna be ill-specified. They will have ambiguity and presupposition. Presupposition being assuming that the model knows uh, the context. Uh, very common example of presupposition is to, uh, given in NLP is uh, uh, which linguist uh, invented the light bulb, which the model should answer no, no linguist invented the light bulb because let's say Edison is commonly credited to invent, uh, to uh, be inventor uh, of the light bulb and he wasn't a linguist. Um, they will frequently be less complex like imagine the type of things you put in a Google search, you you know, you will be like well, uh, quickly three keywords and hope to get the answer, right? It wouldn't be like super convoluted uh, query. Uh, you will never present it as a multiple choice. This is important. A lot of data sets for question answering in NLP will be of the type where you give few options and the model needs to choose it. Uh, I have mentioned last time MMLU as one benchmark that people use to kind of say my LLM is better than yours. It is an example of multiple choice question answering. And this kind of research has in past been uh, funded by research labs in industry that of course then benefited from advances in this space like Google search. Uh, on the other hand, Reading comprehension, as I said, doesn't assume that you need to retrieve the context as uh, question answering, uh, as I have described it here. You know, it won't, we won't give the useful article to Google to then tell us what the answer is, right? Then everything is done once we have that useful article. In reading comprehension, we do give the uh, context and then the model needs to answer some question, which is clear and all of us could uh, answer well uh, in the context of this passage. And then the goal is to say, well, we collected questions that probe, for example, uh, implications of negation, and uh, our human annotators answer these questions with almost 100% accuracy. Therefore, we deem that lay people know how to do this. They have this skill, but our model reaches only accuracy of 70%. Therefore, the state-of-the-art models don't have the ability to reason about negation is a type of thing we would say uh, when we do this kind of probing, reading, comprehension uh, type of question answering. Okay, questions about that, this distinction between information seeking and probing. This is important distinction and the first dimension along which you can divide abundance of question answering data set in uh, NLP. Okay, that seems clear. All right, so then let's move forward. And we are coming to the question you ask. What's the difference between question answering as a task and question answering as a prompting, prompting strategy, right? Almost any NLP task can be framed as question answering. So for example, we have learned sentiment classification. We can frame sentiment classification through questions. Is this positive or negative movie review given movie review? And then the model needs to answer positive or negative, right? We had machine translation. We can ask, please, can you translate this sentence into English? Give a sentence and then get the translation. Many, many things can be framed. Anything can be framed as, as a question in NLP. So is then, should we conclude that every single NLP task is a question answering task, which could be a reasonable thing to assume, but it's not something you should be doing. When we use question answering to frame instances of other tasks that's inherently not question answering, then this is something we will call question answering format. 
format, not the task. So in more formal words, QA as a format is a way of posing a particular problem to a machine, just as a classification of natural language inference are formats. They are not necessarily the task. So how can you know whether something is a question answering format or is it a task? And one useful heuristic you can use here is to ask yourself, how easy would it be to replace the questions in a data set with so-called content-free identifiers? Let me give you a content-free uh, uh, identifier here. It could be um, you just give some movie review. You don't ask any question, right? And the model needs to predict whether it's positive or negative. That's possible to do, right? Like that's what you have been doing in your assignments, right? You were just giving the review and the model was labeling it as positive or negative. However, in truly, in true question answering task, every question will have special meaning, right? So uh, here, um, uh, what what we did, did we have before? Um, when are hops added to the brewing process is one question. Maybe if I open uh, natural questions, I will get different questions. Okay, so questions. When are hops added to the brewing process? What does the world China mean in Chinese? Where is the world's largest ice sheet located today? Who lives in the Imperial Palace in Tokyo? And so on. So these questions, you can't replace them, right? Because then you wouldn't be able to do the task. However, with sentiment classification, uh, where we had um, what is the sentiment, uh, you could have replaced that with sentiment column, right? Or literally nothing. You didn't need that question. So the distinction between is the question's content really important or not is an important distinction between the format and, uh, and the task. Um, here also, uh, there are so-called template filling um, uh, kinds of questions, like when was person born, where where were they born, and so on. So uh, you have question answering data sets that are really restricted in types of information you are answering with them. It's all about, let's say, people, and when and where were they born, and what their profession is, right? Even those questions, although they are not as uh, maybe irrelevant as is this positive or negative review can also be framed as something else than a question. You can have, uh, let's say, person's name, and then you can have um, uh, date underscore born column, and the model needs to fill it in, right? Like you still didn't frame it uh, as, a, as a question. Or maybe to make it even easier for you, like th think about when you're using Google search, when do you actually write it as a question, right? Uh, that's when questions are complex um, enough that you can't just scramble some keywords. And uh, this is basically what we mean by question answering tasks where these questions are from instance to instance too specific and you can't replace them with something at the data set level. Okay. So this is an important distinction. This is an important to remember. We've had first dimension being, um, uh, is your question answering data set for answering uh, information seeking questions or is it designed to probe uh, machines but no one is really interested in those answers to those questions. Now we have also learned the dimension, uh, is this actually a question answering data set and task or is this some just a, another task framed as a question? Uh, answering. Okay, now I'm going to move into showing you different types of questions and different types of answers, and that will kind of wrap the uh, landscape of different uh, question answering data sets. So here you have um, uh, four different que uh, question uh, formats. Uh, natural questions are questions that a human speaker would ask. Something like, when was Einstein born? Answer 1879. Uh, Some data sets uh, you could see in the space are squad or race and so on. You can have uh, uh, also in, in uh, natural questions, you will have 
uh, VH questions, WH questions. So questions like when did it rain and yes or no questions. If your data set is yes or no question, you will very often emphasize that because you basically have only two possible answers. So then it begs the question of, do we just use this as a binary classification of a question? Uh, so very often, if it's a yes, no question, people will emphasize it's a yes, no question. Then you have queries. Queries are something like we all use very often when we search information in our favorite search engine, right? Instead of writing the grammatical question, you just uh, write something which resembles the question. So here, which year Einstein born, or you would just uh, write Einstein um, year born or something like that. So it's just a very informal sentence that sounds like a question. Then in NLP research exclusively, you will have this so-called close formats where basically you will have a blank and that blank needs to be filled, filled in. And this is something you will find under the term of close uh, format. So Einstein was born in blank. That's a closed format where the blank needs to be uh, filled uh, in. And then, uh, I don't know why the answer had changed here, suspicious. Um, and then you have completion, which is uh, you give uh, incomplete context and your model needs to complete it, which is something we see a lot these days, right? With prompting, uh, you can do something like that. Um, but in the in the previous you know years of NLP, this was known as story completion or the choice of the alternative endings for the passage, where you would even get two options and you need to select one which is more plausible for the uh, ending over here. Okay, so you have different data sets will, which will have these different question formats. Uh, and of course you have different answer formats as well. So you can have extractive, very important term, extractive format, which lead to extractive QA or related concepts are retrieval based QA or open ended QA. So here you have some, either you are given, your model is given some context, like in reading comprehension, or it needs to retrieve a relevant context. And given this passage, the model needs to find a span in that passage or retrieve context, retrieve document. That is the answer for the question, which we have actually seen with the, um, the proving uh, example here. So uh, you see here, there is a question. So underlying model here that you don't see first finds a relevant Wikipedia article. It finds it, the article about brewing beer. And then it finds a passage where the most relevant to the question. And then inside this passage, it selects the short answer, which is the boiling process. This type of answer where we actually have selected a span in a given text, that's called uh, extractive QA. And a lot of, lot of data sets before uh, large language models and next token prediction became a way to do everything. Uh, uh, before that happened, a lot of tasks were extractive QA, whereas now you would generate the answer without selecting that from the answer, from the passage, excuse me. So extractive format, extractive QA is this idea that you are retrieving, um, retrieving some uh, uh, relevant context or you are given the relevant context and then you select the span from that context to be the answer to the question, uh, which is different than when the, uh, the answer is generated as it is in retrieval augmented generation, which we will talk about. Okay. Okay, so the extractive QA is nice because uh, the possible answers are substrings in your passage, which makes the evaluation slightly easier. Because if we limit the options for how expressive the model can be, then we don't have that issues that we have with text generation, right? Um, which is um, you could use the overlap with some 
uh, spend that some human had said, this is the answer. That becomes the possibility with the extractive QA, unlike with the uh, generation of the answer where there might be many possibilities. And uh, just because a person have said there is one answer, they would say here, and the model generates something else, but that something else is also plausible, just said in different words, doesn't make the model's answer bad. However, uh, it limits what kind of questions we can ask because everything has to be grounded um, not only in the given passage, but also the answer, the question, we can only ask questions for which answers are in the passage, right? Which limits the number of questions. So if you are developing one of these for research purposes, it's not so comprehensive as it could uh, be. All right, so that's first one. So. Uh, when was Einstein born? Imagine you have retrieved the Wikipedia article uh, about Einstein, and then you have selected the uh, span, which is a single word corresponding to the year he was born. Another popular uh, format of a question answering data set is so-called multiple choice uh, format, where you are uh, given options to the model it needs to select from. Um, so this is a nice benefit of this uh, a format is that the answers do not need to be restricted to the uh, ans uh, excuse me questions do, don't need to be restricted to questions where the answer must be something that's explicitly stated in the passage because now choices can be external you are given it to the model um, also it's nice because um, There are only, let's say, four options, so evaluation is easy. A human had said one of these is correct, and therefore the model should also uh, select one of them as the uh, correct answer, right? Now, the issue with multiple choice format is that writing uh, these choices is really hard, as I can tell you from writing your exams. Finding choices where it's not easy to use shortcuts with the question and the choice to come to the right answer, which the model can do easily. They are, have enough capacity to find this uh, cheat codes. Uh, actually writing those kinds of choices is, is really hard. So if you have multiple choice format for your question answer in data set, your model can easily gamify it and reach very high accuracy not because it understands the connection because between the choice and the question, you are expecting it to have to reach the uh, correct answer, but because, for example, there one word appeared in the choice that and another word appeared in the question and the model remember that a combination of these two words will highly lead to these two, uh, uh, like high likelihood of this choice being the correct choice. This is something called data shortcuts or data artifacts. Models have this capacity to uh, exploit these shortcuts to come to right answers for the wrong reasons. All right, and then we have categorical formats. So answers come from some predefined sets such as uh, yes or no, and you have free form format. Uh, so where we generate the answers uh, independently rather than choosing from the evidence or available alternatives. And because you now all live in the large language modeling world, to you, this might be uh, the most natural question answering format, right? Because a lot of what we do these days is next token prediction where given some question, your model will just generate next token uh, um, uh, after seeing the question, and by doing this, it will uh, generate the answer, right? So this one might seem the most uh, natural uh, to you, but historically, it's not the most common one. It's only recently has become more frequent. With free form uh, format, you will also uh, have see question answering uh, data sets that have uh, sentences as the answer, where you can't answer something just by providing short phrase, a short phrase. Instead, you need to provide a little bit more information, right? Uh, so a lot of these will have um, sentences as, as the answer. However, the issue with the free form format, as it is with all text generation, is that 
then there are many possible ways of expressing the answer. And you can't just use whatever human annotator has written as the uh, answer as your gold standard. I mean, you can to some extent, and then we use overlap uh, measurements, but these, all of these are not um, a great replacement for human judgment of whether the generated answer is uh, good as we are gonna talk more in when we talk about summarization, but remember also that for machine translation, when we talked about blue as a way to evaluate translated um, output, how insufficient uh, it was. Okay, so basically this is the what I wanted to say about question answering landscape. Uh, we had um, division with respect to whether the questions were seeking information or they were designed to test models uh, abilities. Uh, then I have warned you that mm, there is QA format, there is a QA task. And then we looked into a uh, division of various question answering data sets based on the type of a question and type of the answer, right? So if you are creating a new data set to be introduced to the NLP research community, you would specify all of this information. You would say, all right, I am introducing a data set, reading comprehension data set to test models ability to reason about some specific phenomenon. To do this, I'm using, uh, uh, I'm giving the contents, I'm using uh, uh, questions that can be about anything and answers are gonna be free form, for example. You would specify all this uh, information. Okay, uh, since we have only five minutes, I think it's better to stop here than uh, go into the details. But just to give you a little heads up, we are now going to learn next about how to model question answering, when we need to retrieve relevant documents and when we are extracting the span from the relevant documents and when we are actually generating uh, and retrieving together, which is now known as a retrieval augmented uh, generation. Okay, then see you on Wednesday.